information. And this is even more difficult without having a patient here, as you can imagine. So I'm going to try. We wouldn't give you the easy stuff, you know. No, no, of course not. Can everyone see that? Yep. Um, you can yep. see me in the window. We can He's going to help. We can see Mickey. Mickey. Hi, Mickey. All right, so I'm going to try and do some of the stuff on Mickey. <coughs> but I've also got uh, a femur and a pelvis. So, okay. so, so bear with me. Um, examination of the hip joint. You know, I always start with this, but to be honest, most of what I do is very simple if you think about what you're doing. Um, and examination of the hip joint is something that I think falls into this category. And you just pick up very subtle things with experience, provided you're looking for them. So what I would implore, I don't know if any of you were like this, but when I was, uh, when I was a house officer, and one of my stressful things was in the middle of the night putting in a difficult cannula. I would sometimes find myself on the tube just looking at people's veins going, oh, God, I could, I could really put a big gray one in that, like with my eyes closed. You know, equally, you see the old lady with the steroid veins and they look like they're good, but you know the minute you tickle it, it's going to collapse. Actually, looking at people's hips is a similar thing, although you sometimes could get arrested if you become too, um, too stalky about it. But start with people walking, right? Just watch people walk. And these, uh, sure, everyone will talk about types of gait, and I'll touch on that. So a Trendelenburg gait and a waddling gait and an altalgic gait. But actually, within what is grouped as normal, I think there's a huge amount of variation in the way people walk. And for me, the examination of the hip joint starts there. And anyone who does a clinic will, with me will know I don't get the nurses to call patients in for my elective clinic. I go and call them. And then I appear slightly rude because I call them and then I rush down the corridor and I just wait there. And Alex Terralambos brought this point up is you have such a limited time in the clinic to examine someone that getting them to do everything that you do in an exam or an OSCE honestly is impractical. And you just don't have the time. So one of the ways to refine it is you can use the gait, the observation, the looking for walking aids, looking for patterns in that walk from the waiting area to your clinic space, right? And sometimes it looks like you're not helping them. It's an old lady and she's got a bag, but seeing <coughs> how she carries the bag, how she carries a stick, how she adapts, gives you a real insight into uh, one, the level of disability, but also the patient's ability to cope with that. Um, and then I think for me, the next level, the more advanced thing, which is this is the time to do it, is to observe people running in the summer. Because runners, by definition, are fit and healthy and younger. They're not your osteoarthritic group. But yet you will see such a huge variation. I mean, I did it this morning after dropping the kids off at school just a number of people with headphones on run past me and I'm like, oh my God, the excursion of that guy's hips are probably into extension 10 degrees, flexion 10 degrees, and everything else he's getting his stride from his, from his yep. knees, right? And he had long legs, whereas somebody else just looked graceful. You know, you describe it as a gazelle. And that it's all to think about what's the, what's the extension flexion range that they're using What's the internal external rotation? What's the position of the kneecaps as they hit? You know, um, it's all interesting, and you can you can start to think about that once you know the basics. So uh, we we can't in this country get away from this. I don't know how helpful this is, but if if this is a default position that you go to, then stick with it. Certainly for the exam, which I think is a bit of theatrics. Look, feel, move for any joint, right? It's your default position. If you're an SHO and suddenly in the old days, they used to call you to the front of clinical conference to examine this hip. You thought, shit, what do I, where do I start? Just look, start talking and describe what it is that you're looking at and for. 
So the first thing, and this is the great thing in orthopedics we all talk about, apart from the spine guys, is symmetry, right? You've invariably got two of a thing, and sure, both of them can have pathology and be abnormal, but by and large, one side tends to be the problem side, and you have a symmetrical opposite side to compare it to. So you're looking for the overall <coughs> habitus of the patient. Are they fat? Are they skinny? Are they super skinny? Because that's problematic too in terms of healing and pathology. Uh, but obviously morbid obesity is a, is a classic problem. Is there any asymmetry? And this can start with the spine, the bony alignment, the pelvic alignment, the leg lengths grossly, but also the muscles, right? In polio, you will see gross wasting in one limb as opposed to the other. Uh, we touched on gait uh, before, so you're going to observe their gait. Uh, and a normal gait is described as reciprocating. Abdullah, what does that mean? Uh, it means it's uh, like repetitive in a... Like it, it does not change from... Okay, is, he, is he trying to blag this one? What do you think, Kate? Kate's like, I'm not answering, I'm not answering. Do you know what the difference between a reciprocating and a non-reciprocating gait is? Uh, short answer is no. Okay, Nelson. Come in, Nelson Bois. Or Hasib, one of you, whoever D mics first. Hasib, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, do you do you ever ever do any military stuff, whether it be at school in the cadet corps or anything? Were you ever in the military? Nope. Nope. Okay. So so have you ever observed people marching? Yeah. Exactly. So reciprocating means that uh, one one half of his body is doing exactly what the other half did a moment ago. So it's a it's a that that's that's not true. That's not true. But I see what you're saying. So you're saying that the left half will do something, and then the next cycle, the right side will repeat that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not what a reciprocating. And the reason I'm saying this is you will read in old notes, particularly from Stanmore, because George Bentley was uh, quite insistent that you describe this. But a non-reciprocating gait is one where so it is. It's the fact that your right hand goes out when your left leg goes forward. Right? A bit like when you're yeah. marching. Okay? You don't walk with your right hand and your, uh, sorry, your left hand and your left leg, and then your right hand and your right leg. Right? That's not how we walk. It's the opposite hand that goes out. Okay? And so most of us have what's called a, recipro a, a, a reciprocating gait. And the things that you will talk about in terms of the phases I'll come on to, but what you're looking for again is stride length and symmetry overall. Walking aids in shoes. Again, there's an element of theatrics about this in an OSCE or an exam, but certainly if you're looking after patients, it is immensely helpful to notice what are they with a stick? Are they with a frame? Are they with a wheelie frame? Are they wheelchair bound? Are they independent? Look for heel raises, massive wear patterns, right? What's the normal, um, who, I can't see anyone else apart from the guys here, but I know there are more people on. Ode. You've got, you've got Ode, you've got Izzy, Duncan, Ahmed, uh, Cameron. Um, I've already forgotten. Ode. What's yes. The, what, what would you describe as the normal wear pattern of a shoe? What would, if you pick someone's shoe up that they haven't changed. So Mr. Bates never changes his shoes unless his wife buys him a new pair. If you looked at his used shoe, what's the wear pattern on the sole, classically? Think, oh, there would be two areas. One would be uh, underlying the uh, head of the first metatarsal, and the second around the heel. Okay, that's interesting. How many shoes have you, have you worn out under the first metatarsal head? I haven't completely worn them out, but in terms of where the wear pattern is with the treads on the undersurface of a shoe, it would be those two areas that I frequently notice, at least on my shoes. Okay, so, so that's interesting in itself because you're right. There's a, there's a line across the metatarsal heads right and there's a bit of the heel 
And usually the classic pattern is the heel strikes, you roll on the outside of the foot onto your metatarsal heads and you push off on your metatarsal heads, right? So classically what you see is heel wearing that's greater on the lateral corner. You see some wear pattern on the lateral border of the sole and then across the metatarsal heads. Um, and, and there will be variation. You may be somebody who pushes off very strongly off your first metatarsal head, but there's no doubt here that I'm starting to drift into uh, Sesk and Lee Parker's area of expertise. And honestly, <laughs> apart from writing the chapter in Manager's first book, gait isn't my favorite thing. Uh, the skin. So the appearance of the skin, the quality of the skin, evidence of previous scars, ulcers, you know, all of this, there's so much information in looking at someone's skin to the point of which, you know, if any of you travel around Asia, usually outside the temples, whether you believe in, in what's inside the temple or not, when you come out, there's usually a line of people. You know, I love in Vietnam, there's often a barber with a little mirror who's there to cut your hair. But there's a lot of people with crystal balls and horoscope telling them one, one of the things they do there is they look at your skin and your nails and then tell you what your health is. There's a group of people that do that. And of course, you know, I never wasted any money, but it's in, in, incredibly intriguing that people have studied and you can, you, you guys can look at someone's skin and get a lot of information about, um, about their overall health and underlying pathology, right? So what the status of this person's and also about their age. The other thing I will tell you, and you know, it's a very sensitive area talking about race and types of skin. But one thing you will notice about Afro-Caribbean people with darker skin, not Asians, but black kind of skin, is that they just don't age, right? They don't wrinkle. Once, once a, a, a woman of, of, of that um, demographic is over the age of 60, Literally between their 60 and 85, it's almost impossible to put your finger on their age because their skin looks so impressive, right? Forget the dying of hair, which most of them probably do, um, you know, like my mum. I hope she's not watching this, Homer. Don't let her watch his blocker. Um, but their skin, you, that's relevant because when you actually operate on them, when you cut through the skin of someone who is uh, a white Caucasian on steroids, it's like paper, right? Before you know it, you're through all the layers. But the first time you young Afro-Caribbean footballers, you know, that muscular guy, um, you cut that skin, you notice that you've hardly gone through anything the first go, right? So skin is a very important part of any surgeon's evaluation of a patient. So I've nicked these slides just off, um, I think it's Geeky Medics, but there are a lot of these things out there. Um, you know, I suggest that you guys, the thing that these guys do is they be systematically scheme. Your hands, da, 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 da. I don't have the time to run through that, but obviously those are, <coughs> things like cleaning your hands are very important in medical practice. But interesting yourself is just a polite thing to do to all your patients. Um, so there is a lot of overlap into your real clinical practice, but it is not rigid, right? So here we've talked about looking for general inspection, body habitus, obesity, scars, wasting of muscles, and also objects or equipment that they carry. Gait is a cycle. So Haseeb touched on this about how it repeats on either side. An antalgic gait has a very specific definition, which is the stance faces shorter on the affected side. So that's how you're describing it. A Trendelenburg gait is one where the person leans over to the side and swings the leg round. And the reason for this, we'll come on to describe, describe Trendelenburg sign. Thanks, Paulina. Um, is that the hip abductors are not working. And it is the hip abductors, um, I'll just describe this now. You can see that pelvis. This is your pelvis, right? When you orientate it, so when somebody gives it to you, this is how you look at it. When you orientate it in the normal human who's standing up, it's like that, right? With the ASIS and the uh, inferior superior iliac spine in the frontal plane. So as you're coming forward, that's the first thing that you do, right? And now if I turn that sideways, 
you will see that the sacrum then has an inclination and then the lumbar spine comes off of here. Now, you know, people with an increased lumbar lordosis, right, have a more prominent buttock, right? People with a flat bottom, right, have almost no lumbar lordosis, all right? So these are all guides that you're going to get. Now, if you're going back to the coronal plane, right, and your leg lengths are the same, then it makes sense that when you walk, this leg is going to hit the ground if this one's touching the ground. Okay, so how do we compensate for that? Is we shorten the muscles on this side, right? So that contracts, tips it, so that this leg is now free to swing. Okay, now if this muscle can't work to tip your pelvis and allow this free to swing, this leg is going to hit the ground. So what do you do? You throw your body weight over to one side to give it a little bit of tilt. And then rather than swinging straight, you swing this leg round so it doesn't hit the ground. And that's what a Trendelenburg gait is. Okay? Um, a waddling gait is when that's reciprocated on both sides. Palmer, you're looking slightly puzzled. Of course, you know this, but that makes me nervous that you disagree with something. Just shout out if you do. Um, no, I'm just, um, I'm marveling at the waddling pelvis. Okay. That's the pelvic and acetabular surgeon in you. Um, you have to learn this, unfortunately, and I'm not plugging the book particularly, but the, um, the chapter in Manoj's book pretty much covers all of gait. And I think you do have to be able to describe it. And once you describe it, not only is it much more fun when you're observing people in the street, but when you suddenly get roped into the neuromuscular pediatric clinic, um, you are able to not only make a, a reasonable assessment, but you're able to put that down on paper in your note and also not only have a conversation with Miss Mason or Miss Bilsma, whoever the consultant is, but also more importantly, understand what they're saying when they talk to you and the patient, right? You'll follow a lot more if you understand what's happening in the gait cycle um, than if you just go and sit there. Because, you know, there's, there are so many layers of depth to this as to where you start and what dictates in terms of the chicken and the egg. Uh, when I talk about that, one of the classic things is noticing people walking with pigeon toes, right? So their toes go pointing inwards, right? In fact, if you look at a, a geisha serving tea at a Japanese tea ceremony, they're encouraged not only with their foot binding to make their feet look smaller and the, the way that they wear their uh, kimono, but they walk with their feet going like that, almost shuffling, right? Pointing in. Now that in turn means that their patella are pointing in and that's called squinting patellae, right? And that means that their hips are internally rotated, right? Now, if that becomes habitual for someone, then you can imagine when you externally rotate the hips to lay them in their neutral position, they are probably excessively antiverted, right? So people describe the intoing gait as being a sign of persistent femoral antiversion. But to be honest, it's impossible to know which came first, whether the toes are there because the, the hips were, for whatever reason, massively antiverted, or whether the hips became antiverted to give you better control of your hips because you were walking with an intoing gait to start off with. Okay, so now we come to feeling. Right, so you brought the patient in, there's this whole rigmarole again of undressing them adequately, right? It becomes more and more difficult because of time restraints. Uh, you must have a chaperone, I will, I, I will reinforce that. Uh, I know the practicalities can be difficult and it can slow your clinic down, but it is important that you have somebody else there. Exposing people is not as straightforward as it was. I mean, again, you know, I talk about history a lot, but getting out some of these historical orthopedic books where they have people completely naked posting for photographs, you can see these people didn't actually have much of a choice. They've got some professor, maybe some medical students, a photographer there, and they're just being told what to do. Um, 
those liberties have rightly again gone, but it does put a lot of onus on you then to adequately expose them so you don't miss something. You glean all the information that you need to get, but your patient is never uncomfortable. Okay, so here's Mickey adequately undressed. You lie him square on the table. And the first thing that you have to do once they're lying square on the table, so that you have a reference point is understand where the pelvis lies. Okay, and you feel the anterior superior iliac spines and it's really in a skinny person or in a fat person, it's really uncomfortable to just press hard. Okay, so just run your hand over, and this is where experience teaches you not to fumble slash fondle, but just to gently feel, and you'll get an idea where the bony prominence is. And then what you do is you feel both sides, and I come back to the pelvis. What you're trying to do is feel those to make sure that the pelvis is square on the table. If it is tilted, all your inference about the hip movements and the position of the legs is going to be altered, right? And so I would describe this as just as important as when you're positioning someone for a hip replacement in the lateral position, knowing that the hip is like this, not like this, or more importantly, like this. Because when it comes to positioning your acetabulum, if you don't know where that is, you're just guessing, okay? So you square the pelvis on the table. The other thing that you can feel is the greater trochanter. The value of feeling that, especially if a patient may have a tight IT band or more importantly, trochanteric bursitis, again, be sensitive, but it's an important reference point. Okay. Leg lengths. Um, once you've squared the pelvis, right, the first thing I do is I go and look at the heels, right? And do the heels look like they're in the right position, right? There's a lot of natural variation. People say up to two centimeters of discrepancy is normal, right? Um, so there may be a little bit, but by and large, everyone has the equal leg lengths, right? If they have fixed pelvic obliquity, then in order to assess the leg lengths, you have to bring the heels round so that they're square in line with the pelvis, okay? And then people will talk about real versus apparent. This is largely an exam thing. We talked about this earlier in that once you get a leg length scout or a scanogram uh, in terms of imaging, it is way, way to the millimeter more accurate than anything you're going to do clinically. And yet these clinical skills help you understand so much more that when you're intraoperative and something isn't right, I think it is these skills without the measuring tape that you're relying on rather than looking at an a inline scanogram or a standing scanogram. So the real leg lengths are exactly as it says, it's the real length of the leg. And it's measured from the anterior superior iliac spine. You run a tape and for the exam, you must have one of those slick tapes in your pocket. You put it on there, you don't press too hard and you run it down to the tip of the medial malleolus, right? and then you compare it with the other side. For the apparent leg length, you use the umbilicus. Now, especially with lockdown, I think I can move my, my excursion of my umbilicus is probably increased by a certain diameter. But if you think of some of your more obese patients, you could probably rotate your umbilicus over a huge area to account for more than two centimeters easily. So what I would recommend, it would be very harsh in an exam if they gave you that obese patient, but allow it to rest in a position and then make the point that because it's mobile, this may not be as reliable. And so in reality, in a patient like this, you would be relying more on imaging than on this measurement. And I think that's an entirely reasonable and sensible approach. So here you go, apparent leg length measure and compare distance between the umbilicus and the tip of the medial malleolus. True leg length is from the ASIS to the tip of the malleolus. Um, now this is all, when you get a discrepancy in your leg lengths, right, the question is where are they? Okay, and um, the first one up on the top left is Galeazzi's sign. 
And what you do here is you bend the legs up and you keep the heels together. And what you're looking for is a drop in one knee over the other. If it drops like they've demonstrated here, then often the shortening is distributed between the tibia and the femur. If the tibia is the same size, but the femur is short, then you can imagine this tibia comes up to here, but the femur is short. So what happens is this moves slightly more proximal. Um, sorry, how do I mark up again? There was a way of, oh, here we go. So you can see that that femur is going to go in that direction, right? And so the tibia, even though it's the same length, will move to there, right? And so what happens is you not only get a drop in the height, but you get a proximal migration. If, on the other hand, the femur is long, it goes the other way. If the femur is the same size and all the shortenings in the tibia, then it's this, angle, this line that comes to the same point. And this is obviously then gonna be short and so you get a corresponding migration. So what you, you've kind of got to work out in your mind where the lengthening, the, the discrepancy is. Now, once you've identified it, it's in the femur, what do we do now? Uh, the reality is we don't even do this. This is a ballpark estimate. We rely on the scanogram right every time for its accuracy and if i'm doing a hip replacement the hip plan from symbios will tell you all of where the spread is and if somebody congenitally has a short femur there is invariably a range of associated overgrowth of the tibia on that side right so the overall discrepancy is trying to be compensated for but these two things which i think are slightly historical i think you do need to know for the exam we used to have to demonstrate in clinical conference when I was a registrar. Homa, did you ever get to des describe this in a clinical conference? Probably not. No, for sure. Yeah, so you take two that. points, which are the ASIS and the tip of the trochanter, the posterior tip of the trochanter, right? And you connect them with a line. You drop a, a, a line that is perpendicular to the ground, right? So it's dropped at 90 degrees to the flat table or the ground. And then you connect the two to give you Bryant's triangle. And it is the length of this limb that you compare with the other side. Okay. And if that is shorter, it will tell you that the leg length discrepancy lies above the intertrochanteric line and not below it. If they're the same, then it tells you it's below it. Does that make sense? Um, Nelleton's line, and this is a picture of Nelleton. I love that. I want to have a picture now of my hand inside my jacket. I'm not sure, but you know, Napoleon, Nelleton, Achan, I can see it working, to be honest. Um, he drew a line that is from the ischial tuberosity to the ASIS and then measured the distance. So he literally drew that line on and then measured the distance from that line to the tip of the trochanter. Okay. I can tell you nowadays, exposing a patient like that and feeling, especially in the larger patient, for their ischial tuberosity, uh, apart from the obvious discomfort of the examiner uh, of that experience, I don't think anyone's inclined to do it. Okay, but you can see there the DDH, Coxavera pathology that happens within the hip joint is going to give you a leg length discrepancy above the intertrochanteric line. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, these are other lines that people describe. So two lines joining the ASIS and the GTs are parallel to each other. If they shift, those are Chien's lines, also known as Shoemaker's lines, but they classically do cross over above the umbilicus. I've also put this picture here to understand that we all talk about trochanteric bursa, there are a lot more bursa around the hip joint. Uh, there's definitely a big one around the uh, lesser trochanter and the iliopsoas insertion, but there's an ischiofemoral, uh, ischial tuberosity one. And when people start to describe them on MRI scans, it is worthwhile understanding what these bursa are. 
and a lot of them, a bit like around the knee, give you abnormal single, a signal without necessarily giving you pathology. So just be slightly wary uh, of an MRI report that says uh, fluid in the bursa, suggestive of bursitis. Okay, correlate it with your clinical evaluation. So then we move on to move. Um, and bear in mind, again, an irritable, acutely irritable hip or a fractured neck of femur are incredibly painful. So I think it would be really unkind of anyone in an exam to give you one of those. Um, but in the clinic, you will see them. In A&E, you will see them. Be sensible about what information you're going to glean. Right? If, a, if a leg is shortened and externally rotated, you know why that is, right? So you've broken the length of the neck, right? So it's no longer holding the leg out to length. And the main powerful deforming force is the intact iliopsoas that pulls the hip up and externally rotates it, okay? So to try and then do what, see whether the patient has fixed flexion on the opposite side as part of a thorough hip examination will be crazy. But my routine is when I'm moving is I look for fixed flexion. I do Thomas's test. I then, in fact, a step before that, I do a log roll of the leg. Okay. And by that, what I mean, I lay both my hands above and below the patella on the knee. And I say to the patient, do you have any pain here? Right. They invariably say no. If they do say yes, it radiates down there all the way down to my leg, and that's a clue, but invariably they say no. And this is a little bit of Machiavellian deception. They now think I'm looking at their knee and they've said there's no pain. I then roll the whole leg, internal and external rotation, right? And that is an incredibly sensitive sign for me of whether a hip is irritable because the patient is distracted they are not expecting it. And if that is either stiff or more importantly, painful, right, they do have significant pathology in the hip. If it is not, I'm not saying that they don't, but it gives you a gauge, an idea, and the patient is genuinely distracted. This is the same patient who, when you come to flex the hip, says, I can't move it, right? But when you distract them again and say, okay, I need to look at your back to check that's okay. Can you touch your toes? Woof, they're up there flexing the hip to 90 degrees okay so start with the log roll then you go to thomas's test then you go into flexion in flexion you assess internal and external rotation as well as in extension abduction and adduction you only evaluate in extension okay so here is your pelvis okay those two are in the same plane right? What you are doing in Thomas's test with the good leg, right, is you are flexing it up to a point at which you rock the pelvis back, okay? At that point, you have eliminated the lumbar lordosis. So this is why you're putting one hand underneath the lumbar spine to show in that final rock. And you can all do this. Next time you're lying in bed, um, you know, before you start doing your revision, because that's where I always did it, is get both your legs up, right? And then just pull that last bit of rock and you will feel your lumbar spine push down onto the bed, especially if you stick a book or something under it. You will feel yourself press onto it. So that's what you're doing, right? Normally it's lying like this. If they've got bilateral fixed flexion, it's probably lying like this. And what you do is you rock it up into a position that's neutral where you've eliminated the lumbar lordosis, right? At this point, if it's a mobile hip, right? It can extend by five, 10 degrees and it can lie flat. But if it's fixed flexed and it has zero, uh, it, it will basically lift up. And it's that degree of flexion that we describe as fixed flexion. So it's from the table to the amount that the opposite side, so you've rocked this right hip up, as Thomas describes, what you're looking at is the opposite hip. Where is that a socket? Um, there, and if it's sitting like this, the angle is between that femur that's fixed flex there and your table. Okay. Um, I don't have it. I put the pictures up in the last talk, so if you look at that, you'll see the original pictures of Thompson describing it. 
Um, I heard Abdullah talking about um, impingement, FAI, and hip arthroscopy pathology. So when I went through, uh, this was something that Joe McCarthy, Tom Bird in the US, and Ricky Villa in the UK talked about. And 90% of, of hip surgeons, you know, guided by the old arthroplasty centers, pretty much said, we don't believe that this is a thing, you know? Um, now I think that position has hugely changed. And you look at the number of people who are doing even diagnostic arthroscopy are significant. And, um, and you know, that's, that's what we're assessing here. Now, what I've done, a bit of amateur blue tack, um, I'm going to roll a piece of blue tack up and make it a labrum, right? And just if you can see me fitting this on, you'll see the labrum thins out at the anterior rim and posterior rim and is maximal at the top. Can you all see that now? Right, so bearing in mind that your hip sits like this, this is where your anterior rim is, right? That's your posterior rim. And this is your normal hip sitting in there, right? Now, whenever people look at it in the coronal plane, right? The question is how far does your hip abduct before it's going to bump into that labrum? And the fact is we don't in normal life, unless you're a Pilates instructor or doing yoga, abduct the hip that much, okay? Where we do impinge is when we flex our hip, right? When we're seated and we come up into that position and then you cross your leg over. So if you have an, these saw bones, they have interesting anatomy. If you look at their antiversion, I think they're pretty neutral, um, but also they're offset anteriorly. Can you guys see there's often a little bump there? So it's a great way to understand at what position of the hip you can see when somebody kicks across right that's when they're going to impinge when they're skiing and they suddenly flex into that position that's when the labrum that's always been there anteriorly is suddenly going to get hit by the uh, by the cam lesion so faber is flexion abduction and external rotation so you can see there what you're doing there is testing the posterior bit right? You're grinding that bit and checking, is the labrum okay there? Impingement, which some people call the FADA test, so flexion, adduction, internal rotation, is jamming the cam and the anterior labrum. Can you see that? Yeah? So just think of what these movements are doing to the interaction between that ball and socket and it will give you a much better feel for what these tests are trying to do. And all you're doing is rolling something, which in this case is a femoral head, and the anterior bit of the neck, or posterior bit of the neck, against the normal labrum. And if it's pathologic, it will tell you either that the labrum has got a problem, so it could be a pincer because it was restricted and it's painful, or it could tell you that there's a bump there, okay? The C sign, which you see, is actually a sign that is described by the patient. When you say, can you point with one finger to where it's painful, they often just do that. So that's the C, and they point over the greater trochanter, say it's there. Um, this is an example of the impingement tests, looking from above. So you can see you adduct, inflection, and internally rotate. And again, just bear in mind, someone with genuine impingement, this is incredibly painful. So don't jam it in, um, just do it very gently. And as soon as you get the information of the squint in their face, stop, all right? Um, often just the adduction is enough. An adducted cycle into extension is enough. You don't need masses of internal rotation. We talked about Trendelenburg already. This is a picture that describes it. I'm just going to drag that across so I can just show you. So you know I was talking about what that muscle does to tip the pelvis. In the classic Trendelenburg sign, when you ask them to stand, so you ask them to stand up, you ask them, I, what I do is I get them to place their hands gently on mine, 
and then lift the leg up. So they're flexing at the knee with the heel going backwards. They're not coming up into that military, can you see that? They're not coming up into that position. The hip is straight with the knee flexed to the back. And what you're looking for is you're looking at their uh, su uh, anterior superior spines and you're looking for a drop on that side. Now, all that tells you is that that muscle is not working, right? Uh, sorry, this muscle is not working. Hang on, which side am I on? This is the side that's dropped. So this muscle, which would normally tip it that way, is not working, okay? That can be L5 pathology. It can be a lumbar spine sign. And in fact, Keith Tucker, again, used to do this thing where he had one or two patients who had a delayed Trendelenburg. So as they got uh, fatigue, right, from impingement, they would compensate for a while, and then this, this would fatigue, and boom, the Trendelenburg would become positive, okay? So it's an important sign to be able to elicit. Um, Trochanteric bursitis, we all know where that is. Don't forget to examine for it. Um, you palpate, and again, if it's sensitive there, that is the diagnosis that is made there, and then the treatment for it now is an ultrasound-guided injection, followed by physiotherapy to stretch the IT band. Surgery for it works very, very poorly in my, in my opinion. I do do it for ones that don't respond. Um, shockwave therapy, not that impressive, don't tell Ruby. Um, it's very good for other things, Ruby, but just in, in, in recalcitrant trochanteric bursitis that's painful, I haven't found it to be helpful. When it does come to surgery, what I do is a Z-plasty to lengthen that bit of the uh, tensor fasciolata. I think it's a really unimpressive looking operation, but some patients do get benefit because the scar prevents the bursa from reforming. Snapping hips. So the most common snap is the IT band snapping over the GT, but you can get patients with the, uh, the iliopsoas snap too. Um, and what you do for the uh, IT band is you get them into the side on position, you rest your hand over the GT and you in that, it's, look at the hand position, in that position you flex, you bring the hip forward and back, flexion extension, and you'll feel the IT band snapping over the top. Um, quite a, a nice sign and actually not that painful, so one they can bring up to the exam. And then when you conclude this examination, always remember to say, both in the long case and the short case, they're not going to have the time, but you do have to say full examination of the neurovascular status of the limb, you know, know your dermatomes and your myotomes, the joint above, that is very important. So the spine, the joint below, people will say it's important to evaluate, but probably not as important as the joint above. Um, and then don't forget to mention the groin, the hernia, genitalia. So torsion of the testes uh, is not going to come up in an exam but it's something of a younger, slightly embarrassed kind of 18 to 21 year old male turns up with hip pain and you don't think of as a reflex and you miss, um, they will end up with uh, an orchidectomy and it's not, it's not great news. Um, okay, this is a bit more just to show you what these hip impingement things are. So the CAM, it's important to get an idea of this diagram, which is the axial view, the superior view on an AP of a cam, and then understanding that it's a 3D thing running from both. Um, in this country, honestly, we see 85% cam, 5% uh, mixed, and 10% pincer, right? Um, and by the time we see pincer, that labrum is invariably ossified, and so we end up doing, in my hands, a bony resection rather than what we'd like to do, which is a labral takedown, bone resection, and refixation of the labrum. Um, so you can see here, this is what a healthy labrum looks like. In cross-section, it's like a meniscus. So it's coming from a fat base to thin, right? And the interface is about there. <clears throat> You can see here, there's the ligamentum teres. So this is a cadaveric specimen, but it does show you how sharp that edge is. And with a bit of synovial fluid, the feeling is that locks on to the head neck junction and creates a vacuum. 
uh, that allows a, a much better functioning. And that's why if you just resect the labrum in a younger person who presents to you early, it could still pose problems in terms of keeping the congruence of that joint and it might allow it to start subluxing in and out uh, through more extreme physical activity. So another picture to just show you, that's where the bone ends. This is the start of the labrum. And this is with the hip joint in. You can see how congruent the articular cartilage is. And this is the point at which the bone ends and the labrum comes all the way out to the neck, right? And that's why even though your bone, your articular cartilage ends about here, this is the bit of cam that we look to resect, right? So the labrum can fall further down. This is a paper Marcus Banks um, has put. There are a few other... Who else was on it? Um, Alistair Dick, who worked with us recently. It's in the BMJ as a visual summary. I think it's a good thing for you guys to look at and just get ingrained as to where you go. Um, it largely tells you, so the upper section is fracture, acute fracture, stress fracture, avascular necrosis of the femoral head and the causes for it. Acute pathology that is more worrying, so infection and tumor, and then osteoarthritis, right, which is the bog standard. Then you move to the inflammatory arthropathies. Think of that when there's multiple joint involvement. Soft tissue pathology, so snapping hip syndrome, bursitis, tendinopathy. Then you come to the younger femoroacetabular impingement, so the sportsman. And then here you have adult acetabular dysplasia, which is becoming more select simply because childhood management of hip pathology in a unit like ours is brilliant. Okay. And that's pretty much my run through. Um, any questions? Um, Ms. Achan, Odie here. Uh, could you touch upon uh, the nuance of examining patients with hip replacements? Yeah, so um, to be honest, it's, it really depends on how old the patient is and what their expectation is. The worry always for me, especially early on, if a patient says this doesn't feel right, is you forcing a range of motion and levering or subluxing the hip out, right? In a more parotic patient who's had a Stanmore, monoblock, Charlie, long-standing Exeter for 25 years, 30 years, the worry is pushing that range of motion out there is going to fracture the parotic bone right so my question to you is what do you need to know from your evaluation of a hip replacement the number one thing is go back to the gate you've called the patient in you know they have a hip replacement they're walking in you observe their gait. that will tell you if it has a functional excursion in terms of a range of motion it will also tell you that you're comfortable in your examination to not try and find the extremes of range of motion, but to check the general ranges of motion. So it's very light, passive examination of the range of motion. The second thing is, is it painful? Is that why they presented? That's the doorbell. Give me two seconds. So if it's painful, that may, that may um, lead you to focus your examination, to look for particular, particularly other causes which are not directly related to the hip replacement, such as trochanteric bursitis or tendinopathy. Okay. It, sorry, I, so I don't know what Homer said. I think I, I caught the last bit of it is whether it's soft tissue pathology and the examination. But make the distinction between someone who has a, a hip replacement that has come up for evaluation because it's been in for 20 years or it's painful. Now, when it's painful, uh, I think asking the patient how much they can move it and then using your imaging to then give you guidance. So it is not uncommon at all in my to move away from the exam to the clinic room. It is not uncommon at all for me to speak to the patient, do a bit of an examination, then go and study the imaging and then come back and test out some of the information I've gleaned from that first interaction. So all of us, just because of the way our clinics are run, habitually look at the imaging first, the notes and the imaging first before we call the patient. We then get the history from the patient, 
We then do the examination. At that point, what I'm saying to you is, have a very low threshold for going back, reassessing, because now you've got a rough idea of where you're looking, reassess the imaging and then go back and do something. Understood. If the patient is complaining of it not feeling right, a very vague um, complaint, are there any provocative tests that can guide me in, as to understanding whether the problem is arising from the cups from the acetabular side versus from the femoral side this isn't a total hip replacement or must i and i appreciate that we must always go back and support it with the imaging but i'm specifically wondering if there are any provocative tests so, so i i would i would say to you please don't attempt right if the okay. history genuinely suggests in my practice if the history genuinely suggests uh, suggests that the patient is describing episodes of where they feel the hip is subluxing. You look at the imaging and everything looks okay. And this is a persistent problem, right? That hasn't responded to physiotherapy. Uh, the normal excursion looks okay. Rather than me doing a provocative test, what I do is I book them in for an EUA under imaging, right? Because okay. that, at that point, I've eliminated the patient's apprehension and if I do, I, I've got the imaging on it, I can see if it's starting to sublux. Worst case scenario, if it does dislocate in that provocative test, then the patient's asleep, I can reduce it and no harm is done. But it has given me a lot of information in terms of both my further conversation, but also more importantly, my management plan of how I'm going to address this. Clear. Okay, thanks. So, Ode, one, one scenario is that... Um, your patient's complaining of pain, you send them for imaging and there's certain, um, you know, there are certain patterns that you can see sometimes, like for example, um, an uncemented acetabular component that looks, looks too large, that is oversized. And so um, the patient may have signs of, of, of psoas tendinopathy when you examine them. Um, so your, your imaging can help to, to target your examination in that way. But that's um, that's a relatively unusual scenario. Um, Homa, I, I agree with you completely. I don't agree with the last bit, which is it's not that unusual. So what I would say to you through the era of resurfacing slash large metal on metal heads, it was one of the very, very common things we saw in clinic of people presenting with unexplained uh, pain in the groin. It was a sharp pain. But the active test there is not, is, is to ask them to do a straight leg raise, right? And if you want, ask them to externally rotate the foot. So you're principally loading iliopsoas as the flexor and you ask them to do that and they will point with one finger and say, ah, that's it, that's it, right? You then, if you want to, and you're still not sure, the investigation of choice for me is a CT. So you're looking for axial overhang of, of the femoral components over the front of the acetabulum. But um, a skilled MSK radiologist like Muaz can, uh, can identify it and inject, um, inject that and they get temporary symptomatic relief. If that's the case, then if it does become a persistent problem, doing an ileus psoas release will give them relief if it's an elder patient. If it's a younger patient, you need to revise to a smaller cup and head and not overhang. Anyone else? Cameron, it's so unlikely you to be quiet for so long. What's going on? It's all good. Um, it's very good, good to be, you know, recap on everything and, you know, it's really good teaching. It all brings it back to, you know, how it should be. But um, I think that's really important. I mean, what about the role of ultrasound scan guided um, injections of the SERS tunnel? If you're happy with your clinical assessment that this sounds like SERS impingement, would you go straight to a CT first or would an ultrasound scan be more... Uh, no, so uh, what the ultrasound is very good at is telling you if the iliopsoas tendon is, is, is inflamed, right? But you've got a pretty good gut, a gut feeling from your clinical examination that that's the case. What the ultrasound is not good at telling you is whether the implant is overhanging anteriorly over the bone. So that's where the CT is helping me, right? So ultrasound is helpful to give a guided injection, and that does two things. It confirms your diagnosis, it also gives the patient temporary relief to say and make it very clear to them, this is not the treatment. 
unless it's an elderly patient and you're hoping it is. For a younger patient, it's not the treatment. And that was the category of people who had large metal on metal heads or large ceramic on ceramic heads. Uh, you're making it very clear to them that this is giving me information. It may give you temporary relief. But in the longer term, if this is the cause, we may need to do further surgery. Thank you. Segers, any I'm comment? Uh, this has got nothing to add. I think that was quality. I think the, um, I've never seen the blue tack used as the labrum before. I think that's very illustrative. That was, yeah. It, it's a good thing to do. If you get one of these models and you play around, also put the cam on the, the femur and then yeah. you'll really get a much better feel, not only of what tests, what you, what's happening when you do a certain test, but more importantly, or equally importantly, when you're doing the arthroscopic resection, I think there's a big difference between, um, you know, how far you need to go in your clearance. Yeah. You know, I remember Manoj and I having a long discussion about this with, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now, but a hip surgeon from Germany. Um, and, you know, there's one bit which is the aesthetics of what your post-op X-ray and CT look like. And one is the functional clearance so that there is no further impingement. Right? Yeah. Uh, but the more that you play around with these sawbone models, the more you will understand what it is you do when you externally rotate the hip, internally rotate the hip, flex the hip. Why is that different? Why is internal external rotation at flexion so much different from internal external rotation in extension? Hi, Mr. Etchen. This is Ahmed. Hi, Ahmed. How are you? I'm fine. Good. Thanks. Uh, I have a question regarding the fem femoral vestibular impingement. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I feel it is quite difficult to diagnose it clinically because uh, the, the position of flexion, adduction, internal rotation in, is almost an awkward position for any body. So if I excess the internal rotation a bit, so it's painful for, for the normal uh, patient. Okay. Uh, so uh, I feel that the, the MRI is the, the diagnostic thing, but how can I rely on my clinical sense? Especially, as you mentioned, we just uh, see the x-rays. Sometimes I suspect that there is a cam, cam lesion in the hip. When I examine the patient, he is completely asymptomatic. So sometimes I cannot find the... the well, give me a lot of different scenarios there, right? And so let's take each one one by one. The first one is the patient who, the normal patient, where there's no abnormal imaging, who has pain on flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, yeah. right? That, that patient, when you say they have normal imaging, it's likely you've only done a plain x-ray. I think getting an MR in that patient is incredibly helpful. Right, okay. because if the MR tells you that they have no evidence of a cam or a pincer, then that is not going. It, you can eliminate the diagnosis. If, on the other hand, you have someone who has a cam lesion who is asymptomatic, then you have to understand that the majority of people with cam lesions are asymptomatic, right? And the reason for that is think about the meniscus in the knee, right? Your labrum when you are young is full of water and very pliable, right? If you get up into a position of your hip, all that happens is that pliable, flexible meniscus just bends out of the way with the cam, okay? As you get older and you're not active, so say the Pilates instructor who's still stretching it or the 90-year-old lady, I put a picture up, who's got her ankles behind her head, they will still have a pliable meniscus if they had a cam lesion, right? But the person who doesn't stay pliable is then skiing or slips in the bath and suddenly goes from a, a, a normal hip position to that flexed position. That's when they damage the brittle labrum. Mm -hmm. So you could get imaging in that particular patient that's identical on both sides and only one side is pathological because what they've done is they've injured it, right? And that injury can be fairly innocuous. So they don't really remember it being like a car hit me or a bus hit me. It's a little slip, okay? Now we come to another question that you've raised, which is very important, which is what is the value of an MR arthrogram versus an MR? And with the onset of three Tesla MRs, it has become slightly... Uh, more common for radiologists or Josh Lee, for instance, 
who don't rely. They entirely say, I don't need an arthrogram anymore because the free Tesla MR will tell me if there's a tear or not. The reason I prefer an MR arthrogram is it still, and this is part of my conversations with the MSK radiologists and my protocol, is they still not just put dye in, they put local anesthetic in. And that local anesthetic study that's been incorporated with the MR arthrogram, for me, is a really good indicator on which patients are going to do well uh, if they have arthroscopic surgery in my hands. So the patient who has the arthrogram but the local anesthetic did not take their symptoms away, to be honest, even if they have a CAM and a, a labral tear, uh, my, I'm much more conservative in the expectation management. Whereas if their pain disappeared completely after the arthrogram for two days and then came back, I say to them, look, if I go in and do something here, I think we've got a pretty good chance of getting a good result. Okay. Does that help, Arthur? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Duncan, Mo Lebe, any questions? Izzy? If not, I'm going to call it a day. So shoot quickly because I've got another call at 11. Yeah, no, that was very great. busy. Very busy. Duncan, sorry, go on. I, I was going to say that, that was great. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Is you happy? I think so. Okay. <laughs> Mo, Lebe? Yeah, all good. Thank you very much, boss. It's really, really good. I really enjoyed it. Okay, Miss Arshad? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mickey. <laughs> Bye, Mickey. All right, take care. Bye, everyone.